how are we managing these issues? Scientists knew about the collapse of these fish in 2012, but the devastating effect on other species such as sea lions is still not being addressed today with fishing executives blaming the crash of sardines on climate change. This is very similar to what's occurring with dwindling populations of anchovy off the coast of Peru, the loss of Manhattan in the Chesapeake Bay. 98% of all these pelagic fish that are caught uh, are fed to livestock, farm fish and in aquaculture settings and to feed pigs in China. The most heavily killed fish in the world are anchovies at 10 million tons per year in 2020. The most heavily killed larger fish species in the world is the Alaskan pollock, harvested at a rate of 4 million tons per year. Both are still labeled as sustainable. I mean, who would think you could take 10 million tons of any species from anywhere on earth and think somehow they wouldn't be missed? Only us. Only we would think that. But this is a humpback whale trying to find some sardines to feed on. Here's the point regarding our oceans. It's no longer a problem of overfishing. That was a term that could be applied back in the early 1800s. Today, it's about fishing. Not to worry, because now we have fish farms. Over 50% of all fish consumed worldwide are produced from aquaculture, which is growing faster than any other food sector. One reason for this tremendous growth is a very false illusion of environmentalism. Asia now produces 91% of all farm fish in the world, shrimp, tilapia, carp. Now here we have another interesting idea where fish are caught in our already ravaged oceans to feed fish produced on factory fish farms, sometimes at a ratio of up to 20 to one in the form of fish, fish meal, fish oil, Very soon, we're going to run out of fish in our oceans and we're going to run out of land to raise livestock. So we're going to be turning to this, a more closed loop system of aquaculture called aquaponics, a combination of aquaculture and hydroponics that grows both fish and plants. Businesses are already snatching up abandoned industrial warehouses in many urban settings. This happens to be one in Chicago that I visited. They raise fish in tanks grow vegetables on top with the wastewater and then cycle it back to the fish, but they're all using massive amounts of electricity and they use massive amounts of feed inputs. 60% of all fish farms are land-based. Some are indoors, some are outside, like this one that I visited where he's proudly showing me the, as he described it, the protein they produce. Funny, looks, looks like a fish to me, probably has a name. And regardless of where the fish on your plate comes from now or in, the, or in the future, is the process of catching and slaughtering fish, is that process humane? And if it's not humane, then why do we do it? Do any of you know what nociceptors are, especially polymodal nociceptors, they're, they're, they're sensory receptors associated with feeling pain. All of you, all of you have them. I have them. Uh, most mammals have numerous polymodal nociceptors in and around their face, their head, their neck. Well, so do fish. They can, they can feel this. In reality, there's no such thing as sustainable commercial fishing. especially if you apply the three factors of how that word sustainable is defined by the industry itself. In order for a specific marine species and fishery location to be certified sustainable, all three of these objectives that you see must be met. First, there must be no negative effect on the target fish itself, which is impossible because you just killed it. Secondly, there can be no negative effect on any other species, which is impossible because the interconnected ecosystems and there could be, and there must be some verifiable means of monitoring, but again, just slightly over 2% of our oceans are protected and monitored without any fishing. In reality, none of these factors exist for any fish labeled as sustainable. Oh, please note the sobering statistic at the bottom of this slide, over 200 million sea animals are extracted from our oceans every hour. The dynamics at play regarding our disregard for life in our oceans can be found in how we view things very simply. Are, are fish wild animals? And if so, Maybe they should be viewed and kept at pre-human levels, meaning no fishing, leave them alone. 
But instead, fish are viewed as a resource, a food commodity, unfortunately. So their levels can fluctuate according to our consumption pattern as long as some levels exist and we don't go below this arbitrary maximum sustainable yield that the fishing industry itself has placed on a particular species. It's quite an unfortunate system. So why can't we give our oceans a break? What's inhibiting us from providing complete rest for our oceans, which is what they need. And it's what's been shown to work historically in various settings around the world. It's been documented quite well, just let them rest. Is it because of economics? Well, sure it is. Global subsidies for the fishing industry are now at about 35, $35.4 billion per year, which then supports economically the continued devastation in our oceans. Global revenues though, from fishing are at around 150 billion, that's US dollars per year. But only $7 billion of that is from deep sea fishing. Well, fish sequester greenhouse gases among many other things that they do, not counting all the sea life in our reef systems. Recent studies have found that deep sea fish sequester, sequester up to two gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions per year, which equates to $222 billion per year savings in costs in our efforts to battle global warming. Well, so think about that. There's a clear argument, isn't there? For banning fish on the high seas for so many reasons, but here, strictly from an economic standpoint, fish are more valuable if left alone in our oceans as live climate change mitigating agents than as food on our plates. $222 billion versus $7 billion. Seems pretty clear to me. With continued extraction, warming, acidification, and deoxygenation, our oceans that we once felt were so robust will very soon be unable to support what few life forms remain in and around them. So the timelines that you see there for our oceans look, look like this. This is not science fiction. It's, it, it's not something I made up uh, just on the way in today. Uh, it's, uh, it's reality. And quite sadly, this has all happened on our watch. You're looking at what we've created and now passing on to future generations. And we can, we can reverse this though. Our oceans provide half of the planet's oxygen, absorb 20 to 30% of human-induced greenhouse gas emissions, and is the nucleus of the complex food chain. So it's very true that when the oceans die, we, we will die. So how do we solve all this, all these issues of global depletion? Well, we're going to talk about that as we go along today, knowing and doing. Over the years, I've been proposing two categories of solutions. First, there has to be widespread sweeping education of the public and those with a platform of influence. I'm gonna ramp that up myself this year. We need to educate the educated and reach a higher level of consciousness while we're doing this. And second, we need to implement initiatives based on that education, such as creating policies, which then open the doors for businesses and help new and also young farmers help transition existing farms from animal agriculture to plant-based systems and to transition those in the fishing industry to plant-based businesses. Beginning with a reallocation of the $770 billion per year that we are already doling out, we spend globally on subsidizing the meat, dairy, and fishing industries. This money could be spent more wisely and obviously more effectively for education and transitioning purposes to better our planet rather than damaging it. Well, here are the land-based jobs that I think could be easily created and how they would be funded. I have many slides where I, we won't have enough time to go over each thing. So just take a photo of it, revisit this, this uh, video at some point in time. But these are land-based. They're my ideas of terrestrial land-based jobs. Can easily be done. And these are the ocean blue carbon and waterway jobs that I think could be easily created. Just a short list of mine, I've got many more. Mm -hmm.